Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our attendees joining us today for this latest Data Science Central webinar. This is Bill Voorhees, your host. I'm the Editorial Director with Data Science Central and also Chief Data Scientist for Data Magnum. So I'd like to start off our event today by thanking Figure 8 for sponsoring today's event. Figure 8's a longtime supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we're always honored to have them sponsoring our event today. Now, past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com, and if you haven't had the opportunity to view them, I encourage you to take a look. They provide very useful insight into a wide variety of topics of interest to our data science community. Now, today's webinar is entitled, The Essentials of Training Data for Machine Learning, and that will be presented by Figure 8. And before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format of today's webinar. Uh, today's event will be an hour long. Uh, we have one presenter who I'll introduce in just a minute. There'll be 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A following the presentation. Uh, and today's event is being recorded and will be available on datasciencecentral.com later this afternoon following today's live event. Now, I'd also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation because we'll be reviewing and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Jennifer Prenke with Figure 8. Uh, Jennifer is Vice President of Machine Learning at Figure 8. Uh, she spent most of her career creating a data-driven culture uh, in sometimes skeptical environments. She's particularly skilled at building and scaling high-performance machine learning teams. Now, Jennifer trained as a particle physicist uh, she takes great pleasure in addressing both technical and non-technical audiences at conferences and seminars and is passionate about attracting more women to careers in STEM. Well, Jennifer, hey, thank you for being with us today. We're looking forward to your presentation. Now, a machine learning algorithm isn't worth much without great training data to power it. After all, algorithms learn from data, discovering relationships, and developing understanding making decisions, and evaluating their confidence from the training data they're given. And better the training, it, the d better the training data is, the better the model performs. In fact, the quality and quantity of your training data has as much to do with the success of your data project as the algorithms themselves. So in today's Data Science Several webinar, uh, we'll talk about the basics of training data, and we'll cover what training data is and why it's so important what training data looks like for a variety of projects, why training data should be labeled and how to get it labeled, and how much training data you'll need. So Jennifer, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, you can begin just as soon as you're ready to go. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for your uh, introduction. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be with you uh, today. So as discussed, we'll be talking about uh, the importance of uh, training data. And so um, I will start by giving a quick overview about what Figure 8 does. Figure 8 uh, has a very important mission, which is to uh, empower data scientists to train, test, and tune a machine learning for human world. So what does this really mean? So we are actually in the business of helping companies get high quality training data so that they can build their own AI applications. And so as a ma machine learning specialist, I do understand what what is really important in creating a, a real-life uh, training set. Uh, I've been there, I've been on different types of algorithm, and I know, I know all the way to well that it's really important to have high-quality training data. So before we dig into the, uh, the, the topic itself, I would like to start by uh, a quick polling question because we want to make sure that everyone has a, a good understanding of, uh, you know, I mean, we, we want to understand everybody's profile so that I can also like tune better for uh, the type of uh, profile uh, you all have. And so I'll give a better answer to your questions and also make sure that uh, I can uh, basically make a, do a better presentation for you. So the question here is going to be like, what is your primary job role? Are you actually in data science? Are you a 90 person in engineer? Are you in the line of business or are you uh, just a researcher? sure students there to uh, inform themselves. And so I'm going to leave you a couple of seconds to uh, give an answer to that question. All right, I think we should be good. 
So what I see is like we have uh, about 35% uh, people who are uh, data scientists, which is good. Uh, so we also have people from uh, IT, uh, line of business, and researcher. It's actually a good, uh, a good uh, split down. So it's going to be an interesting conversation, and I'll try my best to uh, uh, address everybody's uh, points of interest. So now there is another question that I think is also uh, highly important for, uh, for me to understand a little bit better. So as Bill mentioned, I've worked in different types of organizations, large, large organizations, companies that I would frankly qualify more as not being very data driven, some that were more uh, mature from a machine learning standpoint. And so it's always very interesting to see the different types of companies and how they approach their, uh, their data initiative. So uh, the question here is like, how advanced is your organization uh, regarding their uh, machine learning efforts? Uh, are you using machine learning extensively? Are you just getting started? Are you planning to use machine learning and you're currently evaluating? Or are you, are you here to educate yourself? And a couple more seconds here. All right. So it seems like the, I mean, we have like a, about a third of people who say they are getting started, uh, a third that are here to educate themselves, and the rest is split across uh, uh, using extensively and uh, uh, planning and evaluating. So uh, no worries. I think I have uh, plenty of content that should address like uh, different points, and uh, it should be interesting for anyone regardless of uh, what your, your specific profile uh, looks like. So let's move on. I would like to uh, start by giving quickly the, the agenda for today's session. So uh, I'll start by discussing like why does training data actually need to be labeled? Uh, and then I'll try to run you through like what training data actually looks like. So I mean, it's, uh, it, it's maybe some, sounds obvious, but uh, sometimes it's uh, a little bit hard to under understand like what uh, labeling actually means depending on the type of data you're working with. Uh, and then we'll discuss like the, the concept of uh, uh, building a machine learning model or training a machine learning model. And now we'll discuss training, testing, and validation data. And uh, then we'll go through uh, how much training data you actually need. All right, so uh, in this first section, we're going to discuss like why does training data need to be labeled? And so we're going to discuss like uh, different types of machine learning algorithm ranging from supervised, unsupervised, all the way to semi-supervised learning, which is a not so well-known part of machine learning, actually. So when we, we speak about like machine learning or artificial intelligence, there are actually many components that come into the game, right? And so I think most people focus a little bit too much on modeling. You think of machine learning as being like machine learning models, but there are actually four parts. And so the first part is the data. I always like to start with the data because everything starts with the data in machine learning. Uh, and then you have the logic, right? I mean, so it's, uh, it's basically like the uh, mathematical formula that helps you uh, convert uh, this data into knowledge and wisdom that you can use for uh, predicting the future or uh, predicting if a specific picture contains a dog or a cat. Uh, and then you have optimization because at the end of the day, like uh, the different equations that uh, that basically uh, that, that rule machine learning are actually need to be optimized and uh, computed using uh, optimization algorithms. So this is why uh, traditionally machine learning scientists are a good mathematicians as well. And then you have the concept of feedback. And so people tend to forget about this, but it's extremely important in machine learning to get some feedback. Uh, and so we at Figure 8 like, use uh, a human in a loop approach, which is like a, essentially using uh, a human piece of feedback for, for this, this process. And so uh, you have this equation that we absolutely love at Figure 8, where basically like, uh, we believe that artificial intelligence and is really like the combination of training data with machine learning and human in the loop. All right, so we are here to discuss data. And so uh, I would like to start by uh, encouraging like, uh, those of you who are interested in reading a little bit further to go through. That there is actually a paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data. Um, there was actually a talk at our uh, company-run uh, conference, Train AI, a couple of months ago, uh, basically making that really strong statement that you should spend more time curating your data than you should spend time uh, doing hyperparameter tuning for your model. Uh, this paper is really an amazing paper. I strongly encourage that either uh, you go and check the video that is currently available on the Figure Ed website, or you actually go read the paper and, uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, it, it's a very, very interesting topic. All right, but let's, let's move on and let, let's discuss why training data actually needs to be labeled. So we always talk about machine learning, but machine learning is actually a very complex field and there are different types of algorithms. 
And so uh, the first one that most people think of when they think of machine learning is what we call supervised learning. Supervised learning is uh, the case where you would actually ingest data in which you have knowledge of what uh, your rows of data actually are. So here you have a very simple example on your screen right now where uh, I'm trying to build an algorithm that is going to predict like uh, which ones of these vehicles are trucks and which ones are cars. And so to actually build this model, I actually need to have the knowledge for some training data, some pre-existing data that will be labeled here that actually tells me uh, the red thing that you see on the top is actually a truck, uh, and so uh, the, the other uh, thing that you see slightly on its right is actually a car. And so this is like the concept of labeling data is actually the piece of, of the process where uh, you encode the human wisdom into the data. If you don't have that process, it's impossible for the algorithm to uh, basically return something that is understandable by, uh, by a human. Uh, and so at the end of the day, building a supervised machine learning model is about creating a mapping function thanks to this training data. Uh, we can have classification use cases, this is what you see right now, but you also have a regression where basically the concept of the, the, the output of the machine learning algorithm is going to be a number that uh, you're going to compute. And then you have this other different type of machine learning algorithm, which is uh, also very well known, maybe not as used as supervised learning, which is called unsupervised learning. The most straightforward example that I guess uh, most people uh, think of when they think of unsupervised learning is clustering. Uh, in this case, clustering would allow you to group different types of vehicles together in such a way that you would have one group or one cluster that contains only trucks, the only one that only uh, contains cars, but then you would have no way to name this uh, cluster specifically. So even though you would know these two vehicles are particularly close together, you have no way because you didn't encode human knowledge into your process to know that this is actually called a truck. And so the cluster, the blue cluster here couldn't be called the, the truck cluster. And so what, what people, uh, actually, like if I can go back, so what people tend to uh, forget is that you have a very unique opportunity to actually come uh, with something in the middle, and so that would be semi-supervised learning. Semi-supervised learning is the case where you will use whatever label data you have, because as, as we'll see, label they won't come for free, uh, but uh, you still want to leverage the rest of your data, even if this data is not labeled yet. And so we'll see a very powerful example of semi-supervised learning algorithm later, which is a, a something we call active learning. So I, I always like to love this story of what I call like the, the challenge of big data labeling. I'm gonna, even going to call that the big data labeling crisis. And so here's how the story goes. So uh, for instance, the technology or the, the theory behind deep learning has been around for many, many years, something that was created in the 40s. And so for whatever reason, it wasn't used extensively for a very long period of time. And so that reason was that we never had enough data and we didn't have the technology to uh, gather the data, the amount of data that would be necessary uh, to do a good job with deep learning. And so Thankfully now we're even in a phase of big data, actually we have so much data, right now it's actually becoming a liability for data scientists, uh, but that gives us an amazing opportunity to now use deep learning and this is why data scientists are so excited about deep learning right now. Unfortunately, in most cases, uh, when you talk about deep learning, you're going to use deep learning in a supervised approach, which means, again, that your data needs to be labeled. Go back to the, the, the previous slide with the, the trucks and the cars. You need, if you have a very large number of images, you still need a process to be able to uh, name what is in these different images. And so we've reached a point now where there is just simply too much data for humans to do that alone. And so uh, a brand new approach that our company is taking now is like actually using AI and machine learning to speed up the process of the generation of the labels. And so uh, you already have two ways. Either you label faster using a machine learning algorithm and using a human in the loop approach to fix for the slight inaccuracy that your model can have because no model, no machine learning model is ever perfect. Or you can also decide to label smarter. And so you're basically making the claim that uh, you actually really need like really high quality data that's perfect for your use case, but you don't necessarily need a huge amount of data. And so instead of labeling everything, you just want to label these particular data points that you know are going to be critical for you to do a good job at training your model. 
So let's talk about like labeling faster because this is something where we were really passionate about uh, at Figurate. And so uh, uh, this is an example of one of the, the products we uh, developed recently. And so the problem we were trying to solve is labeling uh, videos, right? I mean, so uh, a typical use case we, we have worked with is like self-driving uh, car companies, right? I mean, so autonomous uh, vehicles. And so the problem such companies would have is that uh, if they want to label 10 seconds of a video, uh, they would typically have like 30 frames per second times 10, which makes like 300 frames. And so if you have um, an average of let's say like 20 cars or 20 pedestrians for each one of these frames, that would do like 20 uh, items, 20 objects times uh, 300, which is like 6 thousand bounding boxes to draw around objects on your images for just 10 seconds. Think about that, right? I mean, so 6,000 objects, assuming that I could draw a bounding box with a speed of like one box per second, which is completely unrealistic. And I, I hope you realize that uh, people will probably take like two to three seconds to do that. Even with one box per second, that would take me almost two hours for just 10 seconds. And I'm just talking about 10 seconds. I'm not talking about the tens of thousands of uh, hours of video that uh, uh, self-driving company, uh, car companies would actually need to, to be able to do a good job and think about how important having a good model is for them because uh, at the end of the day, uh, if their model don't run well, uh, it, it can be a, a danger to, uh, to the safety of pedestrians or to the, the person driving the car or sitting inside the car. Uh, but I mean, again, so we're also exploring this other thing because uh, uh, while labeling faster is very, uh, very appealing, we also believe that you don't necessarily need as much data as you might think. And so it's traditional something that data scientists are doing right now. They're really focusing a lot of their time on like uh, uh, adding more and more and more data because uh, it's been traditionally known that the more data you have, the higher the accuracy. But we're also trying to investigate if it's possible to uh, label smarter. So there's something that uh, a lot of people are familiar with, which is called human in the loop, right? I mean, so here the process would be like a, you build a basic machine learning classifier, a machine learning model, and uh, you would basically, you, you wouldn't necessarily go work really hard to have an extremely high accuracy because you know that you have a human to help in case your model got it wrong. And so the approach here would be like a, uh, if your, the confidence level of your predictions is actually high, you would actually consider that as being a good output, you can actually trust your machine learning algorithm. Or if the, the confidence level is not high enough, then you would ask what we call an oracle. So typically that would be a person or uh, an AI or a process to actually auto label uh, a neuro that would basically tell you like, this is only 20% uh, confidence level for this image. I really want to check if my algorithm got it right. And so that, that was actually allowing people to uh, kind of like have some more freedom not to work too hard on a really high accuracy model. But there is actually a better way, and this is actually what active learning is about. Uh, following the exact same process when you have a low confidence or if you have any indication that your model didn't get it right, then you would ask for a human's input and then you would use that newly labeled uh, data point to re-inject that into the, your training set and retrain the model with these new data points. So now what you are able to do is something that's uh, uh, really interesting. So if you see the next slide here, this is exactly what happens over the course of uh, active learning, right? I mean, so you start with a huge pool of unlabeled uh, training data. The supervised learning approach would be simply like to send this entire data set to uh, a company like Figurate to be labeled, and you would get that back and use that to train your model. Instead, uh, what we're actually suggesting here is that you start by labeling a very small portion of your data, right? I mean, so if you have like 1 million data points, maybe you just want to start with 1,000, 10,000 data points. You will get the labels for these, and you would actually start building a model. And then on the remaining of the, of the training set, you will actually run inferences. So you'll try to test your model on the remainder of the data, and uh, you'll get predictions, and you'll get a confidence level with those predictions. And based on what you see here, you can basically identify which other data points would be the most beneficial for the model to learn from. And so here I'm using the example where you're relying your decision for what's the, the best uh, next data point to involve uh, 
based on, a, on on confidence level, but can really be a really, really wide range of different metadata that you get as you train your model. And so you will incrementally increase the size of your training set, your label training set, until you reach a point where either you run out of budget because labeling can be expensive, or uh, until you actually uh, reach the accuracy that was your original goal. And so hopefully, and there are like real life uh, use cases, and we have use cases to uh, to share as well, where we are really able to reach a similar accuracy with just a fraction of the data. And when I say a fraction, it can be like a, of the order of like a, uh, 20, 10 percent, even 5 percent. And there there is there are records on the on the market if the data is right, uh, where you can go all the way to a, a really really small number and really save a lot on uh, on, um, on, uh, on labeling. All right, so now that we've discussed this, I would like to talk about what does training data look like. So I keep uh, talking about training data, I've talked about labeling, but uh, what does it really mean to label data? So, um, I mean, before you start labeling things, the question you, you will have is like, a, should I be using somebody else's data? Like there is such a huge amount of open source data sets out there. Should I get my own or should I, uh, should I try to collect it myself or should I get something that's, uh, that's an open source data set? And so there are uh, pluses uh, and advantages and uh, challenges with both of them, right? I mean, so the advantage to build your own data is uh, it becomes your own asset. People have been talking a lot about like data being the new oil. So this is literally something that can become an asset for your company, especially if your uh, data generation process is rare. Uh, it's also something you can control. So if you need a very specific type of, type of feature that's uh, uh, really unique to, for instance, your business model, then uh, that's definitely the way to go. Um, the challenge is, though, is that it can be expensive to collect it. When you think about it, like sometimes you need to change instrumentation on your website. Sometimes it's slowing down or making the user experience worse. And so that's not necessarily something that everybody can afford. Uh, you don't necessarily have naturally and ground truth, right? I mean, so in the case of uh, e-commerce, ground truth can be like, a, this is something I recommended to a, to a customer and that person eventually bought this, so I can consider that as being pseudo-labeled as uh, that was a, an, an object or an item of interest for the, uh, for the customer, but not all businesses or use cases actually have the same. Uh, uh, the same process. And then the big problem you may have as well is like when you are actually labeling uh, using figure eight or any other process, you don't know for sure if the job was done well, right? Because you're still asking humans to tell you like uh, what type of animal was seen on that pe specific picture and uh, they can be wrong, they can be focused on something else or maybe they're just here for the money and they don't really, uh, they don't really pay attention to, uh, to the task at hand. So there is always this human component that you need to take into account and realize that it's really uh, hard to believe that your accuracy is always going to be 100%. And then the other option is to use open source data uh, data set. And so that's, that's very appealing because uh, uh, look, the job has already been done for you. You know, this has been true and tested by other uh, by other companies, other people. Typically, this type of data set has been put together by uh, people in academia who know exactly what they are doing. And so uh, if there was a major problem, it's likely that somebody would have found that already. So probably you're going to have a higher accuracy. And uh, uh, it, as I said before, it's uh, definitely something that's true and tested. So where do you get this open source data set? So you have like traditional data set like MNIST, uh, you of like a um, ImageNet, you have a couple of like open source data sets for NLP as well. We actually provide open source data sets for people to uh, uh, to experiment with. And so uh, uh, when we published our first like open source data sets uh, a few months ago, that was a pretty major success. And we have lots of uh, organizations around the world that are uh, actually using the, using those data sets. So you are more than welcome to visit our website uh, and check this out for yourself. Uh, and so basically you have another option which is some kind of like the, the way in the middle which is, which is uh, based on the idea of transfer learning. So you would actually use another training set that maybe or another data set that can be either yours or somebody else's or an open source data set. And you would actually uh, use that as a starting point for your algorithm. Why do you want to do that? Because transfer learning is a process where you can pre-train your model on data that's not exactly the type of data that you are eventually going to need. 
best example I can think of right now is uh, using ImageNet, which is like a, a standard collection of uh, everyday pictures of like animals, plants, people, and so forth and so on, to pre-train a model that you will eventually fine-tune or optimize on uh, satellite images. And so the advantage to, to do that is that if you use a pre-trained model, instead of needing maybe 100,000 images to, to do a good job, you will actually just need a couple of thousands because you're already getting started from a good place. All right, and so because we're talking about ImageNet, I'd, I'd like to tell you the story of ImageNet because I think it's, it, ha it basically says a lot about like why label data is so critical for data scientists. So. Um, uh, computer vision is actually something that people talk a lot these days, but it's been around for a really long time. It's actually something that uh, at the end of the 60s, uh, a couple of people in academia actually believed that over the course of one summer, they would figure it out and basically build a system that's capable of understanding images and uh, basically like a, uh, provide the entire theory behind uh, artificial vision. And so, as we all know, computer vision is really popular right now. And so what, what happened ever since the 60s? Right? And so the answer for that is, uh, uh, for a, like, as you can see on my, my graph here, we had progress only very recently until like in 2014, we actually reached the point where machines or algorithms are, do a better job than humans at understanding images. But it took a really, really long time, and so one of the reasons why we are seeing this progress now, obviously, is related to the fact that we can now use deep learning. Deep learning is uh, really naturally fitted, and specifically CNNs are naturally fitted to uh, to help with computer vision problems. But my my own like uh, explanation here is like uh, ImageNet, uh, basically uh, a couple of years ago, less than 10 years ago, was actually the first open source training set of 14 million labeled images that all computer science, uh, computer vision scientists on the planet basically use as their uh, their baseline for whatever work they're doing. And so until we had this training set provided by Google. Uh, then there was no good baseline, good starting point. And so it was virtually impossible for anyone to come up with like a, a good training set of 40 million images, or like 20,000 different categories to be labeled. Uh, it's just something that as a company you cannot afford to do. And so um, this just tells you that innovation and advances in machine learning are really tightly coupled with uh, the presence and existence of good high quality training data. So uh, let me show you a little bit like what type of labeling uh, we do specifically and generally what hap uh, exists on the market when you're, you're trying to label images. So the first image you see there is like a, uh, what we, we call like a, um, a dot labeling, right? I mean, so you would have a, the face of a person and maybe uh, your instruction to your uh, annotator would be like a, uh, put a point on like on the tip of the nose, on you know, like the eyes and so forth and so on. And so that would become the data that eventually people would use to train uh, a model to identify emotion on a face, right? And so this is pretty straightforward, just like positioning uh, dots on an image. And then, then you have like the maybe the the type of labeling that's the most popular for computer vision, which we call like uh, bounding boxes. So it's basically drawing shapes, specifically rectangles, around uh, parts of interest or objects of interest uh, on an image, right? I mean, so here what you see is like a, a bounding boxes around pedestrians. And so uh, I don't know if you can see that uh, from, from the image, but there is actually a very small person on the all the way on the back of the image. And so this didn't get annotated. And so there's always this question of like, uh, even when you give an instruction that seems to be as clear as please put bounding boxes around humans in, that, in, uh, in this picture, you, you're going to have tons of questions on like, uh, uh, what if that person is uh, partially uh, occluded, right? I mean, what if that person is really, really far? Uh, what if, you know, like a person is standing behind, uh, uh, behind the wheel in a car and so forth and so on. And so it uh, uh, just shows you the level of detail getting high quality label data actually, uh, actually is. And so the other example that uh, we you can see right now is like what we call segmentation. Segmentation is basically like drawing pixel by pixel uh, the different parts of an image that relate to a specific object, right? I mean, so here you see different colors for different 
different cars and then the, you know, like the, the tree line and so forth and so on and so on, you would basically annotate every single pixel by coloring the different objects in order to be able to determine like which part of the object uh, the, the, of the image actually belong to a specific object. And so this is something that we do very naturally as humans. Uh, it's actually something that's pretty complicated to build as an algorithm. So uh, we at Figurate actually build algorithm that uh, create that type of segmentation automatically, but then eventually we always rely on a human to uh, cross-validate and cross-check everything we do. So that's, that's basically the type of uh, uh, process you can put on an image to, uh, to label it. And so all of these images would cons consider to be labeled if you, you, you follow any of these processes. Uh, but then obviously a computer vision is, uh, is interesting, but this is not the only thing we do. We work also very heavily with uh, natural language processing. And so natural language processing is really interesting because there are so many different types of ways to label it and so many different types of training data. After all, like uh, uh, text data has been around for much longer than, uh, uh, than images. And so it's not surprising that uh, maybe we're a little bit more mature in terms of what uh, text data might look like. So types of labeling processes, we go like from utterance collection to entity extraction, uh, intent classification. So this is pretty interesting because this is a case where your label is not something that's objective. It can actually be a subjective task. What was the intent of that person on uh, a specific, um, uh, for that specific piece of task or, or, or tweet and so forth and so on. And so uh, this emphasizes how important it is to have a human involved in this and someone who can actually understand the sensibility. We at Figure8 actually uh, even pushed uh, one step further where we actually believe that when you want to collect intent, you need to make sure that you have the right distribution of annotators. And for instance, you cannot ask people with the same demographics to uh, give you the same answer because for example, what is a, a bad intention for a white male might not be interpreted as a bad intention for, for a black female or, or vice versa. Sentiment analysis, same thing here. It's also something that could be uh, subjective uh, very easily. Relevance identification uh, type of uh, job you would have there is like, here is a search query, here is a result you got for that search query. How relevant do you think that is on the range between zero, um, one and five, for instance? Again, this is not something that's gonna be a standard answer across every single person. And so it's a, it's a fairly different use case compared to the case of uh, uh, predictive bounding boxes. And so again, uh, it all goes down to how, how important it is for you to create the right instructions for your, uh, you, the person who's gonna annotate the data. Uh, synonym parsing, summarization. Summarization is, is an interesting use case because it can just shows you how time-consuming labeling can actually be because sometimes you have to read pages and pages of a document just to reach the point that, hey, this is the topic of the, of the entire document. So just to give you like really uh, example, uh, simple example, so this is basically what you would see if you were to do utterance collection on uh, our website. So uh, basically like uh, trying to capture like the way people would uh, ask for whether their, their flight were, was delayed or not. Uh, it's a complicated task because you also need to validate that whoever creates an utterance is actually like a building something that's in the right language, that's actually answering the right question, that's uh, uh, grammatically correct and so forth and so on. And then uh, entity extraction is typically, you know, like uh, uh, find all the, the basically within a text uh, places where you see the name of a person or uh, a location or so forth and so on. But uh, it actually goes further. And so, uh, for instance, I've worked in e-commerce and so in e-commerce it's pretty common to uh, use uh, entity extraction to try to identify within the, the title of, uh, of an item, like which one is related to the size, to the gender, to the brand and so forth and so on. So uh, many different ways to use this. Uh, if you saw like all the different types of like labeling cases we have on the platform, uh, you wouldn't get bored for sure. All right, so now let's talk about like uh, training, tasting, and validation data, right? I mean, so so what are we talking about when we're talking about like training a model, right? I mean, so if you are among those people who are data scientists, so you probably know all of this like uh, uh, for a really long time, but just like to set the context, right? So when we tr we build models, uh, we usually start with this training set. 
uh, which is like a, a subset of the label data that we have, right? And so this is the data you're going to use to fine tune your parameters, identify what type of algorithm you're going to use, and basically try to start building something. And so at some point, you, you will probably reach the point where you feel you've done a good job and probably, uh, you know, like uh, you, you're ready to move forward. And so at that point, you will use your validation set. Your validation set is also a labeled uh, data set that allows you to measure how good or bad your original algorithm uh, is performing, right? And so this is where, and so uh, once, once you're, you reach that point, like once you're completely happy, you move on to testing, right? I mean, the, uh, your entire development phase is actually a back and forth game between training and validation. You create an algorithm, once you're happy with this algorithm, you, te you, you check on your validation set how good or bad your algorithm actually is. And if you feel that this is not good enough, uh, you would actually go back to your training set and basically go back to the drawing board. And uh, maybe you'll change algorithm, maybe you'll do some more hyperparameter tuning and so forth and so on. Uh, why do you want to check the quality of your data on the validation set? Just because you want to make sure that you are not overfitting. So you want to make sure that once you've built an algorithm, you're actually not just memorizing what's in the data, but you actually have a good case for generalization. And so once you're over this development phase, you actually move on to the testing phase where uh, you just want to see what's the final accuracy of your model and this is eventually what you're going to report, right? I mean, and so this shows you how complex uh, the life of a data scientist and the work of a data scientist can be because this phase, like going back and forth between training and validation can go can go on forever. Sometimes if you're lucky, you go really quickly. And it also shows you that there is a real opportunity to d dynamically create your training set. And this is exactly what active learning is about, right? I mean, so instead of like going back and forth, you would uh, continuously add more and more data so that instead of simply tuning your algorithm in your training phase, you may also decide that it's now time for you to inject a little bit more data because it's very clear that the amount of data you have now is not enough for, uh, for you to reach the accuracy you had in mind in the first place. So how do you choose the right split? So the right split is basically like how do you break down your label data set into training set, validation set, and testing set? The answer is I don't know because it really depends on your use case and there are different, you know, like uh, uh, theories, different people will do different things. I mean, it's, uh, it really depends on how much data you have and what your, your goal and your type of data is. So a typical split would be like 80, 10, and 10%. Uh, another one that's pretty standard is like 50, 25%, and 25%. If you don't have a lot of label data, it doesn't make, it really make sense to have like 50% of your data only used for training set. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, so it's uh, uh, again, lots of consideration at play. Uh, this is what people have been using uh, usually in their, uh, on, on their day-to-day -day basis. So we have this huge problem with like what I call like data greedy algorithm because today uh, algorithm like deep learning actually require a lot of data because they actually have a lot of parameters to fine tune and this is the reason why uh, we actually need so much data. You may want to give an extra thought about like making sure that the size of your training set is actually as large as it needs to be. All right, um, and so. Sometimes even it's not even possible to split data because you just don't have enough data to get an acceptable model. So I mean, in that case, you can always try to play with a, a cross-validation or the techniques or whatever. But uh, sometimes you have to be, get really crafty to uh, to come to a to a good solution. And so again, it shows you how important it is to have high-quality data, but also a decent amount of data. All right. So now that we've talked about like a quantity of uh, a data, etc., so let's let's dig a little bit further and let's correlate like quantity of data with overfitting and underfitting. So uh, what is exactly the problem of over and underfitting? So uh, I, I start by giving you this example of what I call like high bias. High bias is this case where your model is too simplistic for the complexity of your data, right? I mean, so here I have my, my data points, easy case, like a two-dimensional data, trying to fit a line across all of this. And so clearly my data is not meant for that. And so basically what the, the problem I'm gonna have here is like, I don't have enough parameters in my model to, uh, to explain what is happening in my data. 
So this is bad. You definitely don't want to have that use case. Then you have the case of high variance. So here, if you see the model that I drew, like the, the blue uh, line across uh, all the different data points, it's amazing, right? Because it's like perfectly going through every single one of my data points. Truth is, it's not that good because in this case, you're actually doing something called overfitting, which is like a, using a model that's so complex that it is easy for the model to see uh, patterns in the noise in the data. And so it's going to do a very bad job at uh, generalization in the longer term. And so you absolutely want to, use, to avoid this use case. So both of these use cases are really bad. The one that you see on the left is called underfeeding, and the one you see on the right is called overfeeding. What you really want to do is like this like a middle ground uh, where you would consider that as being the right balance, the right amount of parameters. My model doesn't look like it's too complicated and it seems like it's naturally fitting the distribution of my data. And so when you're like, this is the single biggest problem you're gonna face as a, a data scientist or a machine learning scientist, just to make sure that your model's complexity is, is just right. Because if you're, you use too many parameters or not enough parameters, you could spend a really long time trying to optimize for uh, your upper parameters to get an optimal accuracy, but you're never going to get good results. All right, and so uh, now I'd like to talk really, really quickly about what I call the uh, the curse of dimensionality, right? And so this is a problem that uh, uh, data scientists know uh, all too well about. If I have just one dimension, like with a fairly small number of data points, it looks like it's a crowd, right? I mean, so I have lots of data. It seems that uh, I would do a really good job at modeling. As, as as soon as I want to represent the exact same data in two dimensions, so basically when I'm adding an extra feature, you start seeing that it's not that easy, right? I mean, so basically like uh, you, you start seeing some sparsity in the data now. Uh, if I do the exact same thing in three dimensions, then I would have a problem that uh, I just don't have enough data really, really quickly because the amount of data you would need to build a model uh, is uh, exponentially uh, related to the number of features uh, that you're using in your model. Another thing that's very interesting when you're, you're building data sets, like the example you have on the right, is that sometimes something that would be very difficult to model in a two-dimensional space is actually very straightforward to model in three-dimensional space. So uh, what you see on the, on the three-dimensional use case here is like a linear model actually does a very good job at fitting the data, when in two dimensions you actually have to use multiple clusters to be able to, uh, uh, to capture the, the, the purple points over there. So, Choosing the right number of features that will go in your training set and uh, the, the data you're going to collect is also as critical as identifying the right roles. And so how much, at the end of the day, how much training data do you need? So uh, again, unfortunately, this is one of these, uh, these questions where it's really difficult even for someone who's worked uh, with machine learning for many years to give a good answer because uh, it depends on the type of algorithm you're using. It depends on the number of parameters you're using in your model, the accuracy you actually need, uh, your feature space and how your data is distributed in your feature space, the size of the ontology, so basically the number of classes you're considering and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, the biggest thing, like the one thing you really need to remember is that the wrong size of data will automatically lead you to either overfitting and underfeeding, which is why, again, active learning is a very good option to make sure that you dynamically choose not only the rows that go in your training set, but also the size of your data set. All right, so I'm reaching the, uh, the end of my talk here. So uh, just before uh, we move on to the questions, uh, I would like again to uh, encourage you to visit our website and to talk about, uh, to, to, to go check our uh, figure eight data sets. We have a very wide range of different use cases. There's plenty for people interested in computer vision, for people interested in uh, natural language processing. We're planning to release more, but if you're starting with data science or even if you, you want to test uh, uh, a new algorithm or whatever, it's a very good place to, uh, uh, to play with some data that's, uh, that's been on the market for not such a long time. So I mean, uh, you, you, you would get an opportunity to work with something new. All right, so thank you very much for your, uh, your attention. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Uh, we'll get started with today's Q&A session. Uh, I want to thank the audience for their participation. We've had a lot of questions that have come in. Uh, and we'll do our best to get through all of them in the time remaining. 
So uh, during this Q&A session, I'm going to leave up this screen uh, with contact information for Jennifer uh, if you'd like to contact her following today's webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Jennifer, the, the audience wants to cut right to the chase. Uh, the question is, you know, is, is active learning better than supervised learning? Yeah, uh, look, so, so this, is, this is my personal passion. This is something that we're working on very extensively, so I definitely believe that there is something very unique about active learning, but uh, let me tell you about like, the, the challenges of active learning. So, uh, I mean, obviously on the plus side, uh, active learning is giving you an opportunity not only to save on labeling costs, but also making sure that you're using the right data. So that's also an opportunity to get rid of uh, potentially smart, spam, duplicates, uh, data that doesn't really make any sense, and so on. Uh, it's a natural way to clean your training set, and so it's a, uh, I think it's a very powerful tool to come up with the right, the perfect training set for your application. Now, on the downside, uh, active learning remains a semi-supervised learning approach, and so semi-supervised is known to be potentially causing biases in your model, right? I mean, so let me explain why. Uh, when you start, like, over the course of the, the, the way you are, you're building your active learning loops, at the very beginning, you're going to train and build a model that's based on a very small uh, set of data, and so this first model is not going to do a good job. And so if you're so unlucky that the first training set that you pick which originally will most likely be randomly picked, uh, then you can be in a very bad situation where you're going to keep fooling yourself uh, into believing something that's not true, right? I mean, so typically I advise people when they do active learning to, to try something like simulated annealing and try different starting points to make sure that they first uh, sample when they run active learning is not a, uh, is something that's a, actually a good training set and you, you, you just didn't get a bad apple by the way you, you started. Uh, it's also I, the one challenge I see with active learning is that you need to choose what you, we call a querying strategy. Querying strategies are basically the pieces of logic that allow us to identify at active learning loop number n uh, what you need to get for uh, loop n plus one, right? I mean, so essentially what's what is the criteria that's going to help you determine what extra data points you want to re-inject in the training set? And so it's complicated. It's just like deep learning. You need to do some active learning hyperparameter tuning, and then you have to try and test and see what works. So I believe it's highly beneficial, but I think there are like a couple of like uh, tricky points you need to pay attention to, and it's also a little bit more work than just using supervised learning. Well, Jennifer, thank you. And it, when you were talking about things to do to um, uh, to guard against the, the shortfalls that might be present in active learning, uh, is is uh, target shuffling part of that procedure? And and what exactly is target shuffling? Uh, that's can, can you like uh, I would like to understand like better why. Uh, what, well, well why you you mentioned some things that we should uh, yes. do to to, uh, yeah. to mitigate the weaknesses of yes. active learning. Yes. No, so I mean, basically, so, and so you can do like it, it's a very complex topic. So basically, what I'm I'm trying to say is like, uh, most cases and active learning is really a nascent, uh, a nascent field, right? I mean, so most likely when you will start building your very first version of your model, you're going to use a randomly selected sample of your data. And so the, chal the challenge with this is like if you're so unlucky that your data, assuming your data are tweets, for example, like if you're really unlucky that you just get like the spammy tweets, uh, then you're going to build a model. And then if your next pass is going to be to identify like a, uh, this is the extra data I want to use to improve on my model, uh, you won't be able to even trust the confidence level you get on the first pass, right? And so, so basically you have two ways. Either you build something called a prioritizer. So a prioritizer is a smarter way way to do sampling to start with, right? So uh, instead of like randomly selecting, you would actually start using some of the knowledge you have on the data. For example, in the case of uh, uh, tweets, you may want to 
build an algorithm that helps you get rid of the spam or maybe identify languages in spam in, uh, in tweets to make sure you're only treating English spams or uh, use any kind of criteria that helps you purify the training set and avoid the cases where uh, you're going to have really bad data within your original training set. The other way is basically you try more than once, right? I mean, so you try your active learning loop one time and then a second time and a third time to try to understand what you're... And so, again, the trade-off with this is like a, uh, you're going to have to do more labeling than if you had to do that once. But um, uh, what, what can be successfully be done is like a, you don't need to do the entire process. You're, you have a possibility to start doing that just for a couple of loops which keeps your labeling cost fairly low, and then you can see fairly easily if all your different um, uh, original training sets get you to the same convergence point. So if you see at some point that, uh, okay, it seems that after loop, loop three, we get approximately the same kind of accuracy, I get approximately the same type of results from the rest of the data, then it's a good indication that you're, you're doing a good job. There are also more intelligent querying strategies that help avoid the problem altogether. I will be uh, quoting here um, uh, query by committee, for instance. So it's not based on confidence level. It's basically a technique that consists in using more than just one model. Uh, and so you, you have an opportunity to basically leverage the, it's really like a voting strategy. So it's, a, uh, it's an ensemble method that allows you to make sure that uh, you're not fooling yourself because of the weakness of your original uh, testing set and the weakness of the algorithm that you're using. Well, thanks for that clarification. Uh, though I must say there's obviously a lot to learn here, and, and the audience is trying to understand. Um, you talk about loops. In other words, active mm -hmm. learning is a kind of an iterative process of improving exactly. your training data. So the question from the audience is, you know, if we're using active learning uh, to fine-tune a pre-tuned model, uh, wouldn't just a few thousand fine-tuned images just be overwhelmed uh, by the greater number of slightly different images? And I, and I guess the core of the question is, you know, how much fine-tuning is necessary? So let me clarify something. So, um, you, so in the concept of in the process of active learning, you don't really do any fine-tuning as part of the process. So basically, what you are doing is like you build a model and then you freeze that. And so it's really like the value proposition is like you focus on getting a better training set rather than a better algorithm. So you are technically not supposed to do any hyperparameter tuning or any tuning while you're going through these different loops. So you have to trust your model to be good enough. If it fails, then you change and you refine the model and you restart over, but you don't do both at the same time. You don't uh, simultaneously modify the model and uh, increase or improve your training set through active learning. That would be actually a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, now, uh, what, I, what I also heard is like if you use a fine-tuned model or a pre-trained model, right? So that's, that's actually one of the use cases where I would strongly uh, discourage people from ac using active learning because the concept of active learning is really about uh, converging faster to your optimal accuracy than you would if you didn't have active learning, right? I mean, so if you, you imagine like a learning curve, this is something where you would assume you have a very high, steep um, uh, slope at the very beginning of the curve so that you reach like uh, the 80, 90, 95% accuracy is really, really quickly. And so if you're already using transfer learning because you're already using a pre-trained model, usually your starting accuracy before you start doing anything will already be in the 70, 80%. So it doesn't really make sense to even bother implementing uh, an active learning process on top of a transfer learning strategy. Okay, I understand. Now, uh, regarding, uh, you know, how much is enough, uh, the audience is asking, you know, in human in the loop, how do you go about measuring competence? Is that a, uh, an output of the classifier itself? So um, is the question, like, how do we measure the accuracy of the human input in the process? I believe so. All right, so if that's a question, so this, this is an interesting question. It's, not, it's actually not directly related to active learning. So this is something that's a known problem for any kind of labeling process anyways. And so, uh, again, when we provide training data for, uh, for any company, we want to make sure that this is uh, highly accurate, right? I mean, so, um, 
typically other solutions on the market, including Amazon Mechanical Turk, don't have processes like this to make sure that the accuracy of the labeling process is high. So we actually have a process uh, called like uh, test questions that allow us to make sure that uh, people are actually doing what they are supposed to do. And so through this process, and this is actually something that's uh, patented by Figure8, uh, we have uh, we have a way to measure the accuracy of the hum of a uh, of a human, and if a specific human or a specific annotator is not hitting specific requirements we have for our annotators, they just get kicked out of the platform. So basically, we ensure that our annotators are serious, so that we can provide like a uh, the highest accuracies on the market in terms of labeling. Now, is this perfect? No. The way we also help for uh, any type of inaccuracy here is like we strongly advise that you get more than one opinion per uh, data. Row. So typically, uh, if you try to annotate uh, an image, you will never ask for one person to do this. You would actually like, get the input of like three, four, five different annotators, depending on how important it is for you to get a, curious, uh, a high accuracy. And so by doing this, we actually reach a really, really high accuracy. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and uh, is, uh, is there a numerical level of accuracy or confidence that, that you would recommend we strive for? I mean, it really depends on your use case, right? I mean, if you're uh, you're a self self driving car company, I would say like uh, work really hard to get to the 99.9% .9 uh, accuracy. So I mean, it's uh, it's obviously it depends on what you do. Uh, the number of second opinions, like uh, do you want to get like three opinions, five opinions for the same row? It really depends on uh, the complexity of your use case as well, right? I mean, so we have some some of the jobs we run on the platform are really based on like a uh, uh, do you think this person is unhappy on the picture, right? And this is something that's uh, kind of tricky and probably you need like a, specifically if it's something that's a, a, a subjective kind of labeling process, it's kind of, a, uh, it's something that you definitely want more op opinions rather than less. Uh, it's really hard. It's like, and this is why we strongly recommend that the process, the person who actually runs the process, is the person who's going to be the user of the of the data ultimately. And so we typically work really closely with data scientists on our uh, on our customer side. Well, it makes perfect sense. Uh, and and the audience is asking, and I, I hope the answer here is obvious. You know, what what's the best method available for labeling? Any recommended tool that we can use? Well. Uh, figure eight's one anyway, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I believe figure eight is the only like true, <laughs> true solution on the market. No, but so so we have like a. I think what really like makes us really uh, unique in that prospect is like a. Um, We've been around for 10 years, right? I mean, so basically, like, uh, uh, prior to being figure eight, we were actually known as Crowdflower. Lots of people, like, know and have been uh, uh, working with Crowdflower for a long time. I've been uh, working with Crowdflower from the outside. And so uh, we were uh, founded at the time where nobody was thinking this was even a problem, right? And so during all these years, we actually really learned how to do that well. We've developed uh, IP to understand, uh, you know, like, uh, how do you write the right instructions for uh, a contributor? How do you measure accuracy? How many, like we, we have like tons of like uh, uh, in-house knowledge that really benefit our customers a lot. Uh, but what's really unique too is like we've gathered all of this data. We actually like for many, many years, we actually allowed uh, people from academia to use the tool uh, in exchange of us keeping the data. And so we currently like have 10 plus uh, billion label data points across all kinds of industries and use cases. And so this data now is the data that we use when we developed uh, machine learning models to automatically label uh, our images, for instance, right? I mean, so what you've seen like with the uh, drawing boxes around pedestrians or putting bounding boxes around pedestrians, yes, you can ask a human. What we actually do more and more of right now is we automatically predict this and so because we have a lot of training data, we can actually do a good job at building a model to uh, run these predictions. And then with the slight inaccuracy that we have, we use a human the loop approach to make sure that we get a really, really high uh, quality answer. And so we're literally, like we are the company who's been around for the longest for that thing specifically. And so we actually have IP around this. Uh, 
people would consider our biggest competitor as being Amazon Mechanical Turk, but uh, they don't they don't actually like uh, they, they don't have the assets we have, and they don't actually like uh, provide this uh, this automation uh, process over here. They don't provide any way to measure the quality of the data, and so uh, uh, we also have like a much wider range of uh, different languages we can provide if your labeling process is to do uh, translation and so forth and so on. Well, Jennifer, thank you. Those were great answers to some very good questions. And for those of you that asked questions today that uh, weren't answered, uh, we'll be sending all the unanswered questions to Jennifer and the Figure 8 team so they can follow up with you uh, following today's webinar. You know, I have just a few quick announcements. Uh, if you'd please mark your calendars for October 9th, uh, that's our next DSC webinar, which will be uh, deep learning, training your neural network. Also remember that today's taping will be available for on-demand viewing later today, and you can find that on the home page of datasciencecentral.com in the webinar tab located at the top of the page. Well, this brings today's webinar to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance, thoughtful questions, a real special thanks again to Figure 8 for their sponsorship, and particularly for our speaker today, Jennifer Prenke, for her insight into today's topic. Uh, this is Bill Voorhees. I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event. I look forward to seeing you all again on October 9th. Have a great day.